preface of carpenter's geographical reader asia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter preface this book is intended to be used as a reader in connection with the study of geography it is hoped that it will put life into the skeletons known as the maps and clothe them with the flesh and blood of human interest making the various countries and peoples of asia a living whole in the minds of the children it may be used also for the teaching of reading the story holding the pupil's attention and at the same time giving him an introduction to the study of geography and training him to think along geographical lines instead of the title chosen the book might be called a trip over asia with the children for it is the record of a personally conducted tour of the asiatic continent which is supposed to be made by every child who reads it it is the children who do the travelling over seas and lands and it is they who visit their little world brothers and sisters seeing them at their work and their play staying with them in their homes and learning just how they live it is the children who as they travel over the several countries observe the geographical features which have so much to do with making those countries what they are and in creating the industries and the place which their inhabitants have in the commerce and work of the world in these travels the children learn things by their own experiences and observations they study the oceans on the steamers and see the work of the great rivers as they travel upon them in boats it is the same with the plains and the lowlands over which they go on foot or on horseback or by steamer and car and so also with the mountains they climb and the deserts they traverse upon camels they study the civilization of the various peoples while amongst them learning how each is governed how educated and all about its industrial life and especially those features of it which are more or less related to the united states the changes of this twentieth century which are still going on in the various countries of asia are made prominent and also the influence which those changes may have upon us and the rest of the world in the description of each country the author has aimed to leave in the mind of the pupil a definite whole comprising the things he should know concerning it the book is to a large extent the result of the original researches of the author who has made repeated tours to the countries described including two journeys around the world during each of which asia formed a large part many of the descriptions were written on the ground amid the scenes pictured and the most of the illustrations are from photographs made by the author especially for this volume to make the text easier to read the pronunciation of the more difficult geographical names and foreign words is indicated using webster's diacritical marks end of preface chapter one of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b chapter one introduction this book is to be the story of our travels through the grand division of asia each one who reads it is to be a member of the party and we shall go together across the oceans and over the mountains valleys and plains noting for ourselves the many strange things and peoples we see our journey will be a long one we shall travel in a westerly direction and clear around the world before we get back to our homes the first men to make the trip round the globe started out about four hundred years ago they embarked from seville spain in five little sailing vessels under the command of ferdinand magellan a portuguese who had entered the service of king charles v of spain the first stage of their journey was across the atlantic ocean to rio de janeiro where they discovered its beautiful bay they then coasted along the eastern shores of south america to the strait of magellan which was named after their leader passing through that strait they came into the pacific ocean and crossing it landed in the philippine islands that was almost two years after starting and the fleet had suffered many disasters one of the ships was lost before reaching the strait of magellan 
and shortly after that another deserted and returning to spain reported that the rest of the fleet had been destroyed a third vessel was burned while in the philippine waters and magellan lost his life there while fighting with the natives of one of the islands the remaining two ships were taken by the survivors to the moluccas in the dutch east indies where one of them the victoria was refitted and loaded with spices it was brought back to spain by way of the cape of good hope and the west coast of africa and in september fifteen twenty two came to anchor in the harbor of seville having completed the first voyage ever made around the world that voyage took a little more than three years and it was full of dangers hardships and disasters the trip around the globe can now be made in less than three months and if one does not go into the interior of the countries the travel is as safe and as comfortable as any we have at home this tour of ours however is not a mere sea trip around the world it will require many long journeys and some of them will be difficult ones embracing all sorts of experiences we shall go on water and land by canoe and by steamer on foot and on horseback by train and by carriage and in some of the wilder regions shall need elephants camels and perhaps yaks to carry our baggage we shall make many long jumps and at times like hop o my thumb the little fellow who wore the seven league boots may take miles at one step we shall get to asia as quick as we can and after leaving there come home without stopping the exploration of a continent is a vast undertaking and asia is the largest of all the world's grand divisions it contains almost one-third of all the dry land upon earth it is larger than north and south america and both europe and africa could be spread out upon it and leave enough room around the edges for half the states of the union asia is a land of mountains and plains it has the loftiest plateaus and the highest peaks known to man mount everest in the himalayas is over twenty nine thousand feet high its top being often hid in the clouds at a point almost six miles above the indian ocean which lies just below it the continent has many mighty rivers such as the ganges the amur and the yangtze some of its regions are among the best watered parts of the globe and many of our journeys will be upon boats it has also vast deserts and upon the high dry wastes of mongolia tibet persia and arabia we may travel on camelback for thousands of miles and be in sand and rock all the way this wonderful country has all sorts of climates its northernmost parts are hidden by ice while the lands farthest south lie not far from the equator northeastern asia extends out into bering sea almost touching alaska on the siberian tundras we shall need furs and sleeping bags to keep out the cold and in the south shall almost roast in the thinnest of cottons in the north we may use dogs and reindeer to drag us over the snows while in siam and burma elephants will carry us on our way through the jungles a country of so many climates and soils should raise all kinds of crops in northern asia and on the highlands of india wheat and other hardy grains are produced in abundance while lower down are to be found cotton plantations asia is a land of tea and silk it has some of the richest of rice fields and it yields fruit of every description from the pears apples and peaches of the north to the bananas pineapples and mangosteens of those regions which lie in the tropics most interesting of all however are the people asia has always been one of the most important parts of the world as regards its population history tells us that it is the oldest of all inhabited countries and it is believed by many to have been man's first home our own ancestors of the long ago are said to have come from india whence they made their way north into europe they populated that continent and later some of their descendants crossed the atlantic to found the new world asia also contains the lands of the bible it was the birthplace of jesus and the home of adam and noah and of abraham isaac and jacob the whole earth is said to have about sixteen hundred million people and of these more than nine hundred millions are asiatics they number therefore more than one half of the whole human race and considering the world as one vast family are largely in the majority 
let us stop for a moment and see what that means if all the men women and children on this big round globe could be gathered together into one field more room would be needed for the people of asia than for all of the others they would take up more than half of the field and as we looked at them they might seem very strange one third of the whole crowd would be of the mongolian race having yellow skins and eyes which are slanting and of the shape of an almond the majority of the mongolians would be chinese the boys and men having their heads shaved up to the crown and long braids of black hair hanging down from their scalp locks there would be millions of gaily dressed chinese women hobbling along on feet so tied up that they could not move about without pain and a vast number of chinese children dressed in gowns there would also be millions of brave little japanese men as straight as an arrow and japanese girls with yellow babies tied to their backs there would be hundreds of millions of dark-faced people from india with features like ours and here and there moving in and out through the crowd yellow-skinned koreans in gorgeous gowns which fall from their necks to their feet there would be many men wearing turbans and gowns and some dressed only in sheets there would be silk-clad maidens from burma with plugs in their ears as big around as your thumb and dark-faced hindu women wearing white cotton and with rings on their fingers and bells on their toes there would be sober-faced persians of a sallow complexion arabian bedouins as black as a negro and fur-clad siberians with copper-hued faces there would also be syrians armenians and turks each in his own costume but having many things in common with the rest of the crowd if we should continue to watch these people from asia we might observe that they do but few things as we do most of them sit on their heels instead of on chairs and millions of them use wooden pillows and sleep on the floor the majority of the men dress in gowns of one kind or other and many of the women go about with veiled faces we should find that their religions and ideas are different from ours millions of these people worship the prophet mohammed others take the laws of life as laid down by confucius while many follow the teachings of buddha a prophet who lived more than five hundred years before christ moreover if we could follow them to their homes we should discover that each race and country has more or less civilization and that in some respects many are quite as advanced as ourselves they have mighty cities containing hundreds of thousands engaged in all sorts of trade some nations have millions of farms as well kept as we keep our gardens and also stores and factories and temples and schools without number in many places the people can show us ancient structures which are still among the world's wonders of these are the walled cities of china the feudal castles of japan the golden pagoda in burma and the beautiful taj mahal at agra north india we shall also find many modern buildings in course of construction and shall learn that those eastern countries are changing and their people are adopting many of the inventions and ways which until within a few years were common only to us and to the others of our race in the lands of the west but we shall see all this much better as we proceed with our travels end of chapter one chapter two of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b from america to japan on a big ocean steamer our first trip is to be across the pacific and we shall sail from america for the land of japan the pacific is the largest of the oceans from north to south it is more than three times as long as the distance from new york to san francisco and between the western continent and asia as it goes toward the south it spreads out in the shape of a gigantic fan forming as it were a great liquid wedge between our world and that on the other side of the globe the edge of the wedge is driven in between the two great bodies of land at bering strait at that point it is less than forty miles wide a distance so short that it is said on clear days one might sit in his reindeer sledge in alaska and see the cold hills of siberian russia 
the wedge widens rapidly as we go to the south and if we attempted to cross it along the line of the equator starting in south america we should travel ten thousand miles before we came to the moluccas the group of islands where magellan's ship landed on the other side of the pacific if we sailed from lower california along the tropic of cancer we should have eighty five hundred miles to go before we reach china and from san francisco to yokohama japan a little farther north the distance is about forty five hundred miles this last route is along one of the great high roads of the pacific ocean but a still shorter way can be found by going to vancouver or prince rupert and taking a canadian vessel or by sailing on one of the big american steamers from puget sound to japan the latter route is the one we shall travel our vessel is one of the greyhounds of the pacific it is propelled by steam and the distance is now a matter of hours rather than space it will take us from ten to twelve days to go from north america to asia and we shall be quite as safe on the boundless deep as in our own house at home the ship itself is a wonder it is one of the palaces of the ocean and is made almost altogether of steel it is about five hundred feet long and more than fifty feet wide it is long enough to stretch the whole length of the average city block and it would fill the street from side to side the vessel is as high as an eight-story house and it has as many rooms as a large hotel it has its parlors and kitchens its sleeping rooms and bathrooms and it contains a butcher shop a bakery a carpenter shop and all sorts of machinery the dining room is so large that several hundred can sit down to the tables at once and we find the food quite as good as that we have at home our waiters are yellow chinese boys dressed in blue or white gowns and we order by the numbers which are marked opposite each dish on the bill of fare we are delighted with our cabins the little rooms which form our homes throughout the voyage each room accommodates two of us and we sleep in two narrow beds or bunks built against the wall one over the other much like the berths of a sleeping car the room has a sofa as well and also places for washing and hooks for our clothes it has an electric bell by which we call our chinese room boys and it is lighted by electricity the great steamer has hundreds of such rooms they run from story to story down to the lower decks which are filled with a cargo of wheat flour and other merchandise which we are taking from the united states to our customers in japan and china the whole interior of the ship including the machinery is encased in a shell of steel not much thicker than your little finger and it is this alone that keeps out the sea it is in this shell that we are to travel over more than four thousand miles of water without once coming in sight of land we tremble a little as we think of the dangers but the captain says that the loss of life on big ships is comparatively small and that we are really much safer than we should be on land soon after leaving we go down below the decks to see the mighty machinery which is noiselessly but steadily forcing our great vessel on its way through the ocean the engineer tells us that his engines represent twenty thousand horsepower and that it would take a compact line of two horse teams more than twenty miles long all pulling at once to equal their force he shows us the fuel that is daily required to feed them and says it takes several thousand tons of coal to make the steam for each voyage it is a big dwelling house that uses twenty tons of coal in one year our steamer burns several hundred tons every day and enough in one voyage to supply a hundred such homes with fuel all the year round indeed many a large village does not use so much coal in twelve months as we shall consume in the two weeks we are travelling we stay a while far down in the hold watching the half-naked chinese shoveling the coal into the furnaces it is hot and the perspiration stands out on their yellow skins as they throw the black lumps into the fire there are thirty-two of them so employed and they are divided into gangs of eight each labouring six hours at a stretch the shoveling goes on all day and all night never stopping from the beginning to the end of the voyage coming again upon deck 
we find ourselves far out at sea there is no land in sight and the captain tells us we shall see none for ten days or until we reach the islands along the east coast of asia we shudder at the possibility of breaking down in these watery wastes of the pacific where we might float for days and weeks without meeting a steamer and we wonder what we should do in case of a wreck we feel a little safer a few days later when the captain says we are just off the aleutian islands and that the course here is so near the shores that the passengers can sometimes hear the foxes bark as the ship goes by we next approach the kuril islands a rocky chain belonging to japan and then turn to the south and sail for several days well out at sea along the japanese coast the weather now grows steadily warmer and it seems to us we can almost smell the land of japan we go southward some distance out from the island of yizo and have sailed halfway down the coast of the great island of hondo when one morning our chinese boy awakes us with the cry that land is in sight and that we shall soon be on asiatic soil end of chapter two chapter three of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b the island empire of japan japan what a wonderful country it is it is the island empire of the far east one of the most beautiful lands on the other side of the globe lying as it does in the deep waters of the western pacific the country winds in and out like a snake from southwest to northeast a distance of more than two thousand miles this snake is made up of hundreds of mountainous islands and it drags its length through almost every climate known to man its tail formed by the island of formosa lies in the warm waters just above our philippine islands flapping as it were upon the tropic of cancer it thus makes japan our next-door neighbor farther north the snake sinks the lower part of its trunk under the waters of the kuroshiwo or black current a green island speck showing out here and there and then rears it up for eleven hundred miles in the islands of kyushu shikoku and hondo embracing every gradation of the temperate zone its gigantic head is hokkaido or yizo this lies in the cold waters of the northern pacific and is shrouded in snow during the long winter months and at times bedded in ice still farther north running out like a horn from one side of the head is the lean kuril group which almost reaches kamchatka in russian siberia and on the other side the island of sakhalin the northern half of which is still subject to russia japan controls also some of the mainland in southern manchuria and the peninsula of korea now belongs to the empire the main portion of this snake embracing the islands of hondo shikoku and kyushu forms the principal part of japan it is the home of most of the people and it contains all the great cities it is that part of japan which has most to do in the work of the world and it is there that much of our time will be spent the climate of this section is delightful and the air is so loaded with moisture that even in winter the land is emerald green now and then the snow falls on the northern part of the island of hondo but the green grass shows out through the white and the plum trees are in blossom in the midst of our winter the country is one of forests and flowers the people call it the land of the chrysanthemum and the camellia and magnolia grow wild upon its green hills the cherry tree is cultivated for its blossoms and while it is blooming the japanese have picnics when old men and old women young men and maidens and even the children wander about through the trees and inspired by the sight write verses of poetry which they tie to the branches there is no land in the world which has a greater variety of beautiful scenery japan is composed of mountains and valleys it has many small plains and the plains and valleys are covered with farms it has beautiful lakes and numerous rivers flow down its green hills hundreds of waterfalls give it fine water power which is now being applied to the running of factories 
many of the mountains are lofty and all are so clad in verdure that one can hardly believe that the whole country was once made up of volcanoes as we come near the coast on our big ocean steamer the sight that first meets our eyes is a white mountain cone which hangs like a silver cloud on the western horizon it increases in size as we come nearer and a long hazy blue line of coast shows out below it through a thin veil of mist that cone is fujiyama the famous sacred mountain of japan it is more than twice as high as mount washington and during the greater part of the year is covered with snow fujiyama is an extinct volcano and it may some day again burst forth as we come nearer still we can see the vapor arising from another volcano on an island farther off to the south and we are told that we shall be traveling in and out among volcanic islands as long as we stay in japan the country has about fifty steaming volcanoes and there are other mountains which although now quiet may at any time break into eruption the islands contain more than one thousand hot springs where the people enjoy steam baths given by nature a land like this is sure to have earthquakes and japan has so many that its capital the city of tokyo is said to feel one or more shocks every day of the year in the past the people believed that the trembling of the earth was caused by a gigantic fish which lived in the sea and now and then bumped its nose or struck its tail against the shores in its anger today the japanese have as correct a scientific knowledge of earthquakes as any other people connected with the imperial university is a professor of earthquakes and we can find out more about such things here than in any other part of the world indeed it is quite likely that we may feel an earthquake during our tour and if it should be a serious one i am sure we shall never wish for another one happened about two centuries ago which destroyed the japanese capital and in which two hundred thousand people lost their lives the same city had a terrible earthquake in eighteen fifty five during which sixteen thousand houses were thrown down and many people were killed it was in eighteen ninety four that i narrowly escaped death in a great earthquake in tokyo at that time the ground rose and fell like the waves of the sea it cracked open in many places and some of the buildings connected with the palace of the emperor were thrown down the parliament houses were damaged the home of the united states minister was almost wrecked and several foreign buildings were entirely destroyed when the first shock came i was sitting in a room on the second floor of a large office structure belonging to the government talking with one of the officials all at once the walls began to move and the floor trembled under my feet at the same time the clerks began to run through the halls and my japanese friend cried out it is an earthquake come we must run we did so only to see the greater part of the building fall to the ground immediately after we had left it since then i have visited japan several times and have felt many slight shocks but none which has caused any great damage or loss of life one of the most important features of japan is its numerous fine harbors the chief farms and factories are nowhere far from the sea and the people can send their products cheaply to market almost every island has beautiful bays and west of kobe in the inland sea a long narrow strip of the ocean almost shut in by islands abounding in inlets and harbors in which the water is quiet all the year round these excellent harbors have aided in making the people a seafaring nation and we shall learn that their ships now go to all parts of the world another interesting feature is the great ocean currents which wash the shores of the islands tempering their climate at all times of the year one of these is the kuroshiwo or the black current whose waters in fine weather are of an indigo blue and ashy pale on cloudy days the kuroshiwo might be called the gulf stream of the pacific it is warm and it acts as a hot water plant to increase the heat of the eastern side of the islands along which it flows at the same time the western shores are made cooler by cold ocean currents flowing down from siberia these currents bring vast numbers of fish into the japanese waters 
giving employment to several millions of fishermen who use more than four hundred thousand boats in the work the fish are delicious and we shall eat them in our travels all over japan but let us take a little closer view of the islands which compose the japanese empire some of them are mere rocks jutting out of the ocean and many are no bigger than a good-sized farm there are others as large as some of the states of our union and altogether they comprise enough territory to support many millions the total area of japan is far greater than that of the kingdom of italy and it is more than half again as large as great britain and ireland if all the land of the world could be collected together and divided into three hundred and twenty-five fields that belonging to japan would be more than enough to cover one of them the five largest islands running from formosa to yezo contain most of the land formosa is about twice the size of the state of new jersey shikoku and kushu taken together equal the state of west virginia yezo is as big as indiana and hondo is as large as new york and ohio combined in addition on the mainland of asia is korea which is about twice the size of ohio as to yezo and formosa they are to the rest of the empire as our partially settled territories are to the most populous states of the union yezo might be called the japanese alaska and it has among its population of more than a million a few natives called ainos who are not much more civilized than our eskimos they live in rude huts and have so much hair that they have been nicknamed the hairy men of japan formosa which was gained by war from china has many savages who live in the mountains some of them are head hunters of whom but little is known formosa has also many chinese it produces a vast deal of rice camphor and tea japan proper has altogether more than fifty million people and with korea and formosa over sixty-five millions the great majority of them are on the island of hondo which is so large that the people speak of it as the mainland it forms the heart of japan and contains tokyo the capital where parliament meets and where the emperor lives it is upon hondo that have taken place the chief events of japanese history it has been the residence of the emperors since the days of jimu tenno who lived six hundred and sixty years before christ and it was the seat of the great revolution of a half a century or so ago by which japan came out of her seclusion and made herself one of the great powers of the modern world it was of this island that marco polo wrote when he returned from china bringing his stories of sapango an island off the coast of east asia which was loaded with gold and it was this land that christopher columbus hoped to reach first when he started out on his new route to china and discovered america we shall look in vain for japanese gold although marco polo said that the very dogs of the country wore golden collars and that the roofs and floors of the emperor's palace were entirely of gold the latter being made in plates like slabs of stone a good two fingers thick the islands of japan have very little gold although they produce iron copper and silver and have large deposits of petroleum and coal some of the coal mines extend far out under the sea and there is one such mine in the western part of the empire which has more than fifty miles of tunnels all under the ocean some of them lying sixteen hundred feet below the surface of the water end of chapter three chapter four of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b yokohama a japanese seaport it is at the island of hondo that we come to anchor at the close of our voyage we have left the open sea and entered the great bay of tokyo and are now lying inside the breakwaters in the harbor of yokohama surrounded by shipping from all parts of the world there are steamers from china formosa and siberia lying at anchor there are great german ships which have made the voyage from hamburg by the mediterranean sea and the suez canal there are english vessels from southampton and liverpool french steamers from marseilles 
and craft of various kinds from australia south america and the united states there are english german and american men of war belonging to the squadrons which these nations keep in this part of the world and many queer-looking native boats or junks with sails ribbed with bamboo poles from different parts of japan there are also japanese steamers coming in and going out as well as fishing craft and freight boats of all kinds there are steam launches from the hotels which have gathered round our ship and many little passenger boats called sampans paddled by brown-skinned men who motion us to jump in and ride to the shore we wait until the health officers have finished their examination to see that none of us has any infectious disease and then give over our baggage to the little brown men in the sampans they stow it away and lend us a hand as we step into their boats it is but a short trip to the wharves and within a few moments we are at the custom house where clerks in uniforms examine our trunks looking for opium and goods to be taxed leaving the custom house our first sight is a crowd of jin rickshaw men waiting to be hired they are lusty brown fellows dressed in loose-fitting shirts and short tights of blue cotton they wear stiff round hats covered with blue and of the size and shape of a butter bowl turned upside down their legs are bare to the thighs save for the straw sandals held on to their stockingless feet by straw ropes across the insteps and toes each man stands by his gin rickshaw and motions us to get in pointing to his stout legs as he does so as though to say he can go very fast as we take our seats we see other gin rickshaws dart by us filled with all sorts of people some are occupied by ladies and gentlemen others by children going to school and some by businessmen on the way to their offices the gin rickshaw is the cab of japan it is like an old-fashioned baby carriage with two wheels as large as those at the front of an american buggy it has a pair of shafts just wide enough for a man to stand between them and it is usually pulled by one man although he is sometimes aided by another who pushes behind some of the best runners can drag a gin rickshaw carrying one passenger eight miles an hour and many will travel almost as fast as a horse we pay ten japanese sen or about five cents of our money a trip the rate for an hour is ten cents and we can drive our human steed all day long for one dollar it is in gin rickshaws that we explore yokohama we ride around the bund the wide road which skirts the sea behind which are the principal exporting houses clubs and hotels we are then pulled through the streets which lie farther back and take short tours out into the country passing by miles of queerly shaped houses many of which have windows and walls of white paper we spend some time in the stores go to the post office for our mail and then come back to the hotel for the night yokohama is now one of the great ports of the world its population is already about as large as that of the city of buffalo and it grows very fast the place is especially interesting to us because it marks the beginning of our relations with the japanese people and also the opening of japan to the trade of the world this event occurred about the middle of the last century when yokohama was but a small fishing village it was at that time that our commodore perry landed here and made the first treaty between japan and the united states before that the japanese would have nothing to do with foreigners they refused to allow them to come into their country they knew but little about us and our civilization and did not care to trade or associate with the rest of the world when commodore perry showed them the presents he had brought from america to give to the emperor they were greatly surprised and this was especially so when they saw some telegraphic instruments and a toy railroad train the japanese had not heard of such things and it was hard to make them believe that they were of practical use they opened their eyes wide when they saw that messages in their language could be sent over the wires quite as readily as in english they were anxious to ride upon the toy train and in order to show how it worked commodore perry and his men laid a circular track outside yokohama and the little cars were run around this carrying a few passengers each trip the cars were so small that the japanese could not get inside them 
but they climbed upon the roofs and held on tight their gowns flapping in the breeze as the tiny steam engine carried them flying around the track today japan has more railroads in proportion to its size than any other part of asia it has trunk lines connecting all its chief cities and electric cars in the principal towns the country has thousands of telegraph offices and its people send telegrams by the tens of millions a year both the telegraph and railway systems belong to the government and we are told that they are well built and well managed and are run at a profit when commodore perry landed japan was doing almost no business with the rest of the world it was secluded and its people were backward in all branches of modern civilization today japan is one of the chief exporting and importing nations its commerce amounts to many hundred million dollars a year and several thousand foreign vessels annually enter its harbors to bring in or take away goods the empire has some of the best of modern steamers and japanese ships start out every week for china india and europe and eastward across the pacific ocean to us it has vessels going to manchuria and siberia regular lines to korea and formosa and also some to australia which stop at the philippines on the way it has large fleets of steamers and sailing vessels and more than twenty thousand junks and other native sailing craft from being the most secluded of nations japan has become one of the most open and hospitable it now welcomes all strangers and trades with all parts of the world its people are noted for their courtesy and refinement they are active and progressive and are esteemed by all as a very great nation end of chapter four chapter five of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b tokyo the capital of japan it is about a half hour by train from yokohama to tokyo the two cities are only eighteen miles apart and the sea is in sight almost all the way we are carried through green fields spotted with blue-gowned big-hatted men and women half doubled over weeding the crops we pass numerous orchards of pear and plum trees the branches of which are so trained upon framework that they form green roofs shading the ground and go by village after village of thatched houses with smoke coming out at the ends of their roofs we see some large factories on the outskirts of tokyo then shoot through a maze of dark-colored houses and finally land in shimbashi one of the busiest parts of the japanese capital leaving the cars we make our way with the clattering throng to the doors of the station there are hundreds of passengers many of whom wear wooden sandals which clap on the stone floors as they walk all are polite and they bow again and again almost to the ground upon meeting their friends outside the station hundreds of gin rickshaws are waiting their blue-coated bare-legged owners stand in the shafts and an official at the door hands us a check bearing the numbers of the men we may call at the same time he motions to certain of them who trot up and offer their cabs we fix the price per hour for the service and upon taking our seats tell the human steeds that we want to see the whole city and ask how long it will take they reply that such a ride would consume several days at the least tokyo is one of the great cities of the world it contains more than two millions of people and its area is many square miles it would require all morning to walk from one side of it to the other and if we took horses we should need at least a day to go around it our guide suggests that we take a view of the city from one of the watch towers upon which men stand day and night to look out for fires there are many such scattered throughout tokyo and they rise so far above the rest of the buildings that from their tops we can see the whole city we stop at one near the station and climb up we are high in the air with the japanese capital spread out below us at the south is the blue tokyo bay with many white sailing ships floating upon it and at the north and east we can look beyond the city to the green fields and trees of the country the town which lies under us is like nothing we have in america there are no tall ungainly structures as in new york and chicago and no ragged streets with buildings of all shapes 
and sizes jumbled together with vacant lots showing out here and there in the chief business center and about the imperial park are some foreign structures but most of the city is a level of one-story and two-story houses with many great temples rising out of green parks the houses are built along the edges of streets without sidewalks they are roofed with black tiles and have walls of unpainted wood turned gray by the weather marking the streets with long lines of black and gray beginning at the bay they run far back into the country they border both sides of the sumida river which here flows into the sea and are enclosed in a network of canals upon which junks and native craft of all kinds move to and fro notice the trees the lakes and the silvery waterways did you ever see anything more beautiful there are trees everywhere and here and there are wide open places such as the parade grounds of the soldiers and the great parks surrounding the temples where the people come to worship according to their religion of which we shall learn more farther on that forest at the east with the twelve-storied tower rising above it is unio park noted for its many cherry trees whose blossoms in spring seem to fill the air with pink clouds in it is the zoological garden and nearby are the university and other large schools on the western side of the city we can see sheba park where are several grand temples and right in the centre is the vast expanse of ground beautifully rolling in which the palaces of the emperor stand these grounds are surrounded by three wide moats or ditches walled with stone they are filled with water and crossed by great bridges guarded by soldiers between the two outside moats are many fine modern structures of brick and stone not unlike the public buildings of our national capital they are occupied by his majesty's cabinet and contain much of the machinery by which the empire is governed but let us climb down from the watch-tower and take a gin rickshaw ride through the streets our men will go as slow or as fast as we please and we can stop them at the interesting places and get out and walk how queer it all is except on the ginza which is the chief business street and in a few other places where foreign blocks have been erected the buildings are more like the bazaars of a fair than the substantial structures of an american city there are but few large houses and only now and then one which has more than two stories the heavy ridge roofs extend far out over the walls and the floors are high up from the ground the outer walls are made in sections which slide in grooves back and forth they are pushed aside during the daytime and we can see all that goes on within we look in vain for windows and doors the rooms are divided by walls of lattice work backed with white paper through which the light comes these walls are also in sections which move in grooves one inside the other in going from one room to another we push aside a section of the wall instead of opening a door and we can throw several rooms into one the japanese are naturally modest but their ideas of propriety are different from ours and we observe strange scenes of family life as we ride through the streets here a slant-eyed maiden is making her toilet she has pushed back the wall of her home and we can see her as she sits on her heels on the floor before a little round mirror and primps and powders and paints her lips red while the people go by without noticing anything strange in her actions next door is a family eating dinner they sit or kneel on the floor and each has his own table of the size and height of the box of a bootblack a little farther on we stop at a store the merchant sits flat on the floor with his goods piled around him and the floor is his counter we sit there as we shop hanging our feet out into the street as we do so the wall at the back is moved wide apart and the merchant's family comes out to see what we buy the little boys have almond eyes and short hair and the girls slant eyes and long hair done up just like their mothers now our shopping is finished and we ask the cost of the goods we have purchased the amounts are handed to one of the boys who figures up the sum upon a box of wooden buttons strung upon wires by moving these back and forth he can add and subtract as quickly as we can with pencil and paper and we find the boys figures correct but let us turn from the shops to the people 
the streets are not narrow and we are not jostled as we move through the crowd the hundreds of queer-looking men women and children who pass us are the soul of good nature and they treat us as brothers they smile and bend low as they meet one another and when we stop at their stores or enter their houses they bow again and again almost to the ground we try to be polite in return but the japanese back is more elastic than ours we soon grow stiff with the unusual motion and feel that even the india rubber man of the circus might wear himself out with bowing in a tour through japan clatter 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 what a noise people make as they go along the street they wear curious sandals of wood or straw and their stockings are foot mittens in which the big toe has a separate place during wet weather the sandals worn have blocks on the bottom about three inches high so that the whole nation becomes that much taller whenever it rains at such times the girls pull their gowns up to their knees and the boys tuck theirs under their belts to keep them from being spattered with mud all the people carry umbrellas which cover the upper parts of the body and the streets are filled with bare yellow legs raised upon stilts which seem to be carrying queer-looking bundles the japanese dress is peculiar both men and women have on long flowing gowns extending from their necks to their feet these are folded across the body in front and fastened at the waist with a sash the chief difference in the dress of the sexes lies in the sash that of the man being little more than a belt while that of the woman is more than half a yard wide and so long that it can be wrapped several times around the waist and tied in a great bow at the back the sash is often of the finest of silk and is the most expensive part of the costume the gowns of both men and women are open at the front being folded across the person and held together by the sash girls are taught to walk so as not to pull their dresses apart they take short steps and turn their toes inward one odd feature of the dress is the sleeve this is made very full and sewed up at the wrist so that it can be used as a pocket the colors of the clothing are exceedingly modest most of the people wear blacks blues and grays and it is only the very little children who have on the bright gaudy hues which many suppose to be most liked in japan how busy every one is as we go through the streets we observe that the stores and houses are filled with workers there are crowds at the shops buying goods and peddlers by hundreds hawking their wares there are porters by scores with great loads on their backs and servants carrying baskets fastened by strings or ropes to the ends of a pole which rests on the shoulder we see children in groups playing about everywhere many of the little ones are at work and in some sections every house contains an industry of one kind or another in which the children do much of the labor there are also many on their way to and from school and of these we shall learn more farther on in our travels we pass many people going to the theatres the plays of which last from morning till night and meet family groups bound for the temples each person carrying his lunch that they may have a picnic in the groves after their prayers jin rickshaws pass by us carrying statesmen to the houses of parliament and other jin rickshaws are seen here and there in which are bareheaded ladies who are going out calling or taking the air there are but few horses and carriages and very few automobiles the street cars are everywhere and the electric roads will take one to any part of the city at a much lower fare than those of our country we observe that the people use the cars freely and also that modern machinery is doing away with hand labor in many of the shops nevertheless we are impressed with the fact that human muscle is still performing a large part of the work of japan observe that little post office wagon which is carrying the mail from one side of the town to the other it is pulled by a man who wears a blue jacket and tights the dray behind it belongs to one of the big wholesale establishments and it is taking a load of goods to the train the motive power consists of those two almond-eyed men who are harnessed in front and of others who are shoving behind with both heads and hands their muscles stand out like thick cords as they work and the sweat is rolling down their brown skins in diamond white streams as we go through the side streets we see that they are still watered by hand 
each householder being required to lay the dust in front of his dwelling and we observe others of the old customs which our civilization is fast crowding out the stores of the main business sections are changing they now have counters like ours and sliding glass windows there are some large department stores with concerts and shows to attract customers tokyo has an excellent telephone service and there are telegraph lines through all parts of the town at night the main streets are lighted by electricity we meet newsboys on every corner and soon realize that the japanese capital has become a modern city very different from that which stood here in the days of commodore perry it is now one of the world's greatest capitals with most of the modern improvements of new york paris or london end of chapter five Chapter Six of Carpenter's Geographical Reader, Asia by Frank Carpenter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Betty B. Home Life in Japan. The best place to study a people is in their own homes, and we can learn much by spending a night in a Japanese house. These people live simply, and although there is some difference in the comforts of the rich and the poor, the home of the well to do family which we shall visit today will serve as a type for that of japan we take jinrikshas and soon reach our friend's dwelling it is an unpainted frame building of two stories with a heavy roof of black earthenware tiles supported by gray wooden posts which rest upon stones we can see clear through the house and get a glimpse of the beautiful garden lying behind the outer walls have been pushed back for the day and the air rushes through on all sides we see almost the whole house before we leave our gin rickshaws and wonder at first if the family has not moved away the rooms are all bare and there is nothing like our american furniture in sight where are the tables there are none for the japanese do not use tables like ours where are the chairs those cushions which lie on the mats take their places for these people prefer to sit on the floor how clean everything is the road at the front is well swept we can see ourselves in the strip of bare boards which runs round the inner walls of the house like a porch and the rooms back of this are covered with matting of the cleanest white straw this matting forms the carpet of japan it is not woven in strips like that sent to america but in soft mats three feet wide six feet long and twice as thick as this book each mat is bound around the edges with black cloth and when all are fitted closely together over the room the floor is covered with panels of white bordered with black the mats are the same everywhere and the size of the room is known not as so many feet wide and so many feet long but by the number of mats required for the floor how is the house heated there are no stoves in sight and no cellar or basement in which a furnace might be hidden the house has no chimney and we see no signs of stovepipes the heating is done by little brass lined boxes filled with ashes in the center of which a handful of charcoal is burning these boxes are known as hibachis they are common all over japan they form a poor means of heating and as winter comes on the people keep warm by putting on more underclothing so that the nation appears to be growing fatter and fatter as the weather grows colder but how can they cook without stoves they have little clay ovens in which they put charcoal and they boil and fry over the coals let us go into the house as we approach a little maid-servant comes to the front she gets down on her knees spreads out her hands on the floor and bumps her head on the mats in order to show us respect she asks us to take off our shoes and come in the japanese never wear shoes in the house and we have already learned it would be far more polite to keep our hats on than our shoes so in our stocking feet we step up into the house and take our seats on the cushions very soon some of the family come in they bow low kneeling down and bending again and again to the floor as they rise they draw in their breath with a loud half whistling sigh as though they were overcome by the honor which we are conferring upon them by calling we suck in our breath as we bow in return then the maid-servant brings in a little box of charcoal for lighting our pipes 
for in japan every one is expected to smoke she next fetches a tray which she places before us on the floor it contains a porcelain teapot and some tiny cups each about the size of half an eggshell she again falls to her knees and offers them to us with a bow we drink in japanese style sipping the tea with a loud noise to show that we like it but here come the children who have been playing in the garden back of the house they are dressed like their parents and they bow to us in the same way they are very respectful for all japanese children honor their fathers and mothers and for one to have a bad child is disgraceful the mother takes one of the little boys in her arms and rubs her cheeks against his it is in this way that the japanese show their affection they do not kiss or shake hands though boyfriends and girlfriends often go about with their arms around one another's shoulders what is that on this little one's back that is a doll the little one is carrying her baby the japanese mother often goes about with the baby tied to her back and the children sometimes do the same with their dolls as soon as a girl is old enough she is taught to take care of her little baby brother or sister that way and as we ride through the streets we shall see many children with live babies hung on their shoulders a girl of eight or nine years will often carry a baby so tied and take it about as she plays the baby blinks through its queer eyes at the great world around it and when it grows tired it drops its head on its shoulder and goes fast asleep while the little nurse keeps on making mud pies playing ball or otherwise amusing herself our japanese friends invite us to take supper with them and stay overnight they entertain us in the parlors which are at the back of the house soon they tell us that the bath is prepared and that as the honored guests we are to have the first turn the japanese are exceedingly cleanly and every well-to-do home has its own bathroom it is a sign of good breeding to ask a guest to have his bath first the custom is such that all the family no matter how many the children bathe in the same water and in the same tub and the servants get in at the last this seems strange to us but we learn that no soap is used until after leaving the tub one cannot cleanse himself without soap and the hot water in the tub is used to merely open the pores of the skin after leaving the tub the bather has a basin of water and soap with which he washes all over rinsing himself clean with fresh water there are public baths in all the japanese cities and in tokyo alone there are more than ten hundred in which several hundred thousand people bathe daily the cost is but one cent a bath so that even the poorest can keep himself clean the little maid servant comes and leads us to the bath it is a neat little room with movable walls of white pine she pulls a section back and we enter in one corner a stream of cold water flows through a wooden pipe into a barrel from which a trough carries it off into a little brook in the garden outside from this barrel we shall get cold water after we are through with our bath and with that shining brass basin which we see on the floor we can pour cold or warm water over our bodies after using the soap the bathtub is of wood it is much like a short oval barrel under it burns a fire of charcoal with a stovepipe running up through the water at the back of the tub this pipe being protected by a strip of white pine which keeps one's body from touching it the water steams slightly but from its appearance it is no warmer than milk when fresh from the cow so having undressed we jump in phew how hot it is the water is almost boiling and we gasp as we sink half scalded to the bottom we quickly climb out finding our skins as red as a beet and the little servant who stands outside the wall and peeps in giggles as she enters and hands us our clothes the japanese are fond of hot baths and the people of all ages from grandparents to babies half scald themselves every day by this time supper is ready and we enjoy a japanese meal we sit on the floor as we eat and each has his own table which is not quite a foot high and little more than a tray the first course is sweet cake and candy with sake a beverage made from fermented rice it is brought in by a little maid servant who kneels down and bows low as she hands it to us next comes a soup made of beans and with it some raw fish cut in slices and served with a queer sauce called soy this is of a dark brown color and is made of a mixture of vinegar 
salt and fermented wheat then there are salads and pickles of various kinds there is a dish of stewed eels and after that some green pears as hard as a stone so served because the japanese like this fruit green the supper closes with rice and tea the rice is brought in to us in a round wooden box of the size of a peck measure it is offered again and again for the theory is that no one need go away hungry if he has plenty of rice the tea is served in little cups and we observe that our japanese friends sometimes pour hot tea into their rice throughout the meal we watch our friends eat and as far as possible imitate them the soup is served in bowls of the size of a large coffee cup each has his own bowl and we sip the soup by raising the bowl to our lips as to the fish rice and salad we do our best to eat them with chopsticks but it is no easy task if you will balance two long slate pencils between your thumb and two fingers and try to pick up grains of rice or bits of other food with their ends you can see how we eat it takes a long time and it is only the politeness of our japanese friends that keeps them from smiling as our food drops on its way to our mouths the japanese eat three meals a day a breakfast on rising a dinner at noon and supper at sunset they seldom have more than two courses and eat less than we do they are good cooks and many of their dishes are fit for a king they make delicious fish soups and have fish cooked in all sorts of ways they eat but little meat except that of fowls and butter and cheese are not common rice takes much the same place that bread has with us it is usually steamed so that each grain is separate from the others and is eaten without sugar as a cereal or vegetable and not as a pudding some of the people are so poor that they cannot afford rice and millet and other grains are used in its stead the japanese have delicious sweetmeats and they make one kind known as mitsuami which is much like fig paste or a stiff candy jelly of the color of honey this is delicious and moreover it is of such a nature that it will digest other foods the weakest stomach being able to stand it it is also used as a syrup after we have finished our supper with our japanese friends we sit with them a while on the floor the neighbors come in and chat with us both women and men smoking little pipes as they talk we play games with the children and the girls show us their dolls in this way the evening rapidly passes and at last our callers having left the time comes for sleep now there is a commotion the servants go out and pull the sliding walls to until the whole building is a well-closed box ventilated only through the cracks at the corners they have shut up the house for the night for some time we have been wondering where we should sleep we have seen no sign of a bed and when our friends take us upstairs to the room in which we are to stay we find it as bare as the parlor below our little maid-servant however goes to one side of the room and slides back a board which hides a recess in the wall from this she pulls out armful after armful of soft thick comforts or quilts and lays them upon the matting one over the other turning down the top one for a cover we look about for sheets and are told that the japanese do not use them but the maid gives us long cotton kimonos as nightgowns instead we ask for pillows and she hands each of us a block of wood of the size of a brick with a roll of soft paper on top she shows us how to fit this under the neck allowing the head to hang out over the edges we try it but find that though it may do for japanese children who are accustomed to it it will not do for americans and so we roll up our coats and use them instead the house grows quiet we are tired with our long day sightseeing and within a few moments have dropped off to sleep and are dreaming of home End of chapter six chapter seven of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b the emperor how japan is governed the chief object of our travels to-day is to learn something of how the japanese empire is governed it is ruled by an emperor through his cabinet and parliament the emperor is the executive and his powers are somewhat like those of our president he has the right to make treaties with other nations 
and he can at his will declare war or peace his cabinet consists of nine ministers who are at the heads of the great departments which carry on the government they correspond to our department secretaries at washington and include ministers of the treasury state war and navy as well as of agriculture justice interior education and communications the last having to deal with the postal service and also with railroads and telegraphs when commodore perry came to japan the people had a feudal system much like that of europe during the middle ages the country was divided up into states owned by daimos or lords each of whom had many samurai or soldiers these lords and their retainers formed the japanese army and their commander-in-chief called the shogun was the real ruler the people were heavily taxed and they had but few rights the emperor was supposed to be too holy to rule and was kept secluded in his palaces in kyoto in central japan these conditions continued for some years after japan was opened to the trade of the world then the greatest men of the empire decided that the country should have a modern government they came together and overthrew the shogun and in eighteen sixty eight made the emperor the actual ruler they formed a constitution and established a parliament elected by the people now all the laws are made by the parliament and the people themselves say who and what shall be taxed the members of parliament vote all the money for carrying on the government and in this way every one has his own rights and the japanese are almost as free as ourselves the houses of parliament correspond to our congress there are two houses an upper and a lower the upper house is much like our senate or perhaps more like the english house of lords it represents the nobility most of its members being chosen from the noble families although some are appointed by the emperor on account of their learning or for the services which they have rendered the state the lower house corresponds to our house of representatives its members are elected by the people only the men being allowed to vote parliament meets much like our congress and its business is done in about the same way the members discuss all measures relating to public affairs and by a majority decide what is best to be done it is not a long ride from the palaces to the parliament buildings there is a big wall around them entered by gates inside which we see hundreds of gin rickshaws with bare-legged men in butter bowl hats and blue tights and jackets waiting for their employers the members of parliament we enter and find the houses very like those of our congress at washington and the scenes much the same leaving here we drive to the emperor's palaces his majesty has a vast estate in the heart of tokyo made up of hill and valley with lakes and streams and beautiful woods as we saw from the watch-tower it is surrounded by wide moats filled with water where great lotus flowers float upon their green leaves on the banks are many wide-spreading pine trees centuries old we cross the moats on bridges of marble and passing soldiers and servants in european clothes find ourselves in the home of this mighty ruler it is far different from that of our president the palaces consist of many one-story buildings constructed after the style of japanese temples they cover acres and have hundreds of rooms in some of them the walls are sliding screens of plate glass which move in grooves so that they can be shoved back and several rooms thrown into one the ceilings are decorated with the finest embroidery and some of the walls are covered with brocaded silks like that of a ball dress the floors are inlaid in a sort of wooden mosaic and the matting upon them is as soft as thick moss we pass through hall after hall and at last reach his majesty's presence he is dressed in the uniform of a general of his army and looks not unlike some other japanese we have met he is much revered by the people any japanese man would give up his life for the emperor his soldiers rush into battle shouting his name and they esteem it a glory to die in his cause this respect for the emperor is a part of the education of the japanese schoolboy a promise to be true to his majesty is hung on the walls of every schoolroom and in case of a fire that promise is the first thing the children are instructed to save the people think so much of him that they keep their heads bowed as he goes through the streets the emperor is a hard-working monarch 
he loves his subjects and most of his time is taken up in the affairs of the government he has cabinet ministers who bring him daily reports from all parts of the empire and in time of war it is he who directs the movements of the army and navy he devotes himself also to the arts of peace and does all he can to develop japan the empress is also greatly beloved by the people her majesty has her own palaces inside the moats in which she lives with her secretaries and servants she wears foreign clothes upon all state occasions although when at home she prefers japanese gowns and japanese ways her majesty is at the head of many movements for the advancement of women she sometimes visits the schools and she has established a great school of her own for the daughters of the princes and nobles on our way back from the palace we pass many policemen and we observe that good order is kept everywhere the police have foreign clothes much like those worn by the police of america they carry swords and clubs and sometimes tie their prisoners with ropes and drive them on their way to the jail there are now police stations all over the empire and life and property are quite as safe as in any part of our union we can go through the country as freely as though we were in europe or the united states japan is now on an equal footing with all other lands and travelers have the same rights the police will not stop us and ask us as to our business the japanese are a courteous people and everything excepting the fortifications is shown to the stranger there are courts everywhere and all are allowed a fair trial the greatest penalty that can be inflicted is death by hanging but this is only for murder most other crimes are punished by imprisonment and fines and for small offences the fines are sometimes as low as five cents we shall next visit the department of war which regulates all matters relating to the japanese army the country has now one of the best armies of the world and its arrangements are such that it will always have plenty of soldiers we see the schoolboys everywhere drilling they begin as soon as they are strong enough to carry a gun and go through their exercises under the command of real army officers at the age of seventeen every boy is expected to enter some branch of the army and after he becomes a man he has seven years to serve as a soldier the japanese navy is one of the strongest of the world the country has naval schools and it has shipyards in which great gunboats are made it has also many large war vessels which have been constructed in europe and it is well able to defend itself from invasion by other nations and to stand up for its rights we find that one of the most important offices of the emperor's cabinet is the minister of communications who manages the railroads and also the postal and telegraph systems in the past japan had no means of transportation except horses or men and all letters were carried by messengers whose chief costume consisted of a cloth about the waist and a coat of tattooing the service was so expensive that only the rich could afford to send letters then an american from our post office department was brought out to japan he showed the emperor how we carried our mails and his majesty ordered that the same system should be introduced here the present postal arrangements are good and letters are sent all over the country for less than two cents apiece the government makes its own postage stamps and picture postal cards are sold by the millions if we should call at the post office department we might learn that its service is now handling more than a billion postcards and letters a year and that it carries many million newspapers and books connected with every post office is a savings bank in which the children are urged to deposit their pennies and there is also a telegraph office at which one can send a fifteen-word message to any part of japan for ten cents we shall meet japanese postmen on the streets of every city we visit they wear blue clothes and their blue mittened feet rest on straw sandals they deliver the letters at all the houses and collect from the mailboxes at the street corners just as our postmen do our next visit is to the treasury department to learn something of the money of the country these people use coins of gold silver and copper and they also have paper banknotes made in their own bureau of engraving and printing the unit of value is the gold yen worth about fifty cents but this is not coined a silver yen of the size and shape of our dollar taking its place each yen contains one hundred sen 
or sens and each sen ten rin there are fifty sen twenty sen ten sen and five sen pieces of silver and there are also nickel coins of five sen the copper pieces are two sen one sen one half sen and one rin or one tenth of a sen the latter being worth about one twentieth of one cent of our money End of chapter 7chapter eight of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b japanese children at school books and newspapers everywhere we go in japan we meet many children going to school we can easily know them for the law requires that all school children shall wear the same costume the boys have on kimonos over which are worn a sort of divided skirt that falls from the waist to the ankles they also wear caps the girls have kimonos and very full dark red or plum-colored skirts with heavy plaits their skirts fall to their feet or rather to the foot mittens which end at the ankles they go bareheaded most of them carrying paper umbrellas there are now public schools everywhere in japan and the education they give is quite as good as our own there are kindergartens for girls and boys up to six years and schools of different grades for those who are older as well as high schools business schools schools of manual training and great universities all children are compelled by law to attend school until they are ten years of age and they may go to the high schools if they wish some japanese families are so poor that they need their children to help them and such children are put to work in the fields the stores or the factories when they have passed the age at which they are required to attend school many thousands of boys and girls continue their education until they are grown studying the same things that are taught in our country after leaving the schools not a few go to the colleges and some graduate at the great universities all the schools have physical exercises and the girls as well as the boys go through their gymnastics on the playgrounds in some respects the studies of these children are more difficult than ours our alphabet has but twenty-six letters that of japan has forty-seven and in addition there are so many word signs in the language that an educated man must know thousands of characters some of the signs mean whole words or short sentences and there are curious ends and crooks which have to be learned let us visit a primary school and see the children at study and play it is early and the little ones dressed in their uniforms are tramping along on their wooden shoes through the streets some have their books done up in bundles with cloths wrapped around them and others carry ink bottles attached to strings tied around the necks of the bottles here comes the teacher we can hear him afar off as he clatters along on his white wooden sandals he wears a gown of dark gray and spectacles cover his eyes when he comes up the children bow down almost to their knees and as they rise suck in their breath as a polite mark of respect the teacher does likewise he smiles as he approaches the schoolhouse and placing his sandals outside walks in and takes his seat at the desk the children also leave their shoes in the hall they have desks like ours and the schoolroom with the maps on the wall and blackboards remind us of home but see how queer the books are they begin at the back instead of the front and the lines run up and down the page instead of across it what curious letters it is hard to tell one from another they make us think of the characters we see on the tea boxes of a grocery store here is a class of five boys learning the alphabet the teacher makes the characters on the blackboard and the boys copy them on sheets of paper singing out their names as they do so do they write with pencils or pens no they have brushes much like those we use for watercolors and they paint the letters with black india ink notice how they hold their brushes their hands do not touch the paper the brush is almost vertical and instead of writing across the page from left to right they begin on the right hand side of the sheet and paint the lines from the top to the bottom each child has an inkstone beside him upon this he puts a few drops of water and then rubs the stone with a little black cake of india ink thus making his own ink as he writes no blotters are needed 
the paper is soft and porous and sucks in the ink as it comes from the brush they also write with the pen and for this they use the same kind of ink that we do there is a little boy learning to count with the soroban he has a box of wooden buttons as wide as this book and about a foot long like the one we saw the bookkeeper use in the store the buttons are strung upon wires they represent units tens hundreds and thousands and by moving them up and down he is able to do sums of addition subtraction multiplication and division more quickly than we can with pencil and paper it is said that any sum in arithmetic can be performed upon the soroban even to the extracting of square root and cube root in some of the schools we shall find translations of american textbooks and many of the scholars will tell us that they think their hardest study is english because everything connected with it is wrong and foremost they must begin at what seems to them the wrong end of the book they write from the other side of the page and the sentences go across the page the wrong way they also find the pen awkward to handle but they feel they must learn to write english for their country is now a world power and it does a great business with us and other nations speaking that language the japan of today is a land of books and newspapers nearly all the books used in the schools are made in japan and tens of thousands of new ones are published each year the newspapers like the books begin at the back and their columns run horizontally across the page instead of up and down it the lines run up and down the columns instead of across them and one reads from the top of a line to the bottom and then goes to the top of the next line to the left and so on until he finally reaches the end of the sentence this is marked by a little circle or the japanese period instead of the dot that we use the newspapers contain advertisements editorials stories and telegraphic dispatches it takes a vast number of characters to form the type for one paper for a thousand letters may be used on the same page indeed the characters are so many that boys are employed by the printers to run from case to case and collect the type as required end of chapter eight chapter nine of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b japanese children at play but how about play are the lives of japanese children made up of nothing but school and hard work no indeed they play as well as study and they have quite as much fun as we have at school there are large playgrounds connected with the schools and they engage in athletic sports of one kind or other at every recess they have more playtime during the school day than our children for on the average fifteen minutes are taken off from each hour for them to go out and drill or run around the grounds and do as they please the japanese play basketball football and cricket they exercise as soldiers and we see little companies with flags marching about here and there they have all sorts of playthings and there are toy stores in the cities there are peddlers who wander over the country selling nothing but toys and men who carry little ovens or stoves with real fire in them about the streets and who have sweet dough for sale a boy or girl can hire a stove for an hour for less than five cents and the stove man will furnish the dough and look on while the child makes up cakes and bakes them sometimes the man cuts out japanese letters and the child cooks them and learns their names as he plays there are also men who sit in the streets and mold animals gin rickshaws and other things of rice paste for children for a very small sum the dressing of dolls is a favorite pastime for girls there are three days of every year during which the people celebrate the feast of the dolls at this time all the dolls which have been kept in the family for generations are brought forth set upon shelves covered with red cloth and admired some of them represent the emperor and the empress and are treated with great honor receiving the best food of the feasts to which the dolls are served three times a day after the three days are ended these dolls are put away but the little japanese girl has other dolls with which she plays the year round there is also a day devoted to the boys 
we shall know it by seeing great balloon-like paper fishes floating in the air from sticks fastened to the roof of each house in which a boy baby has been born during the year and also from other houses where the parents are glad they have boys the japanese make kites of all kinds and shapes some are singing kites which give forth a music like that of an aeolian harp as they float in the air being kept steady by two long tails one tied to each lower corner others are of the shapes of dragons and babies eagles and butterflies and of all sorts of animals some kites have their strings coated with powdered glass for a length of thirty feet from the kite this part of the string is first soaked with glue after which the glass is dusted upon it as the glue hardens it holds the glass particles and the string becomes as sharp as a file it is so made for kite fighting a sport in which the boys try to see whose kite is the strongest as they fly the kites through the air each tries to make his string cross that of his fellows and to pull it this way and that so as to cut the string of the other in two in such cases the owner of the victorious kite has the right to the kite which has been cut loose the japanese have games of instruction as well as games of play they have puzzle maps made of pieces of wood and by putting them together they learn the shape of japan and of the world they have a game much like our authors called one hundred verses of one hundred poets which teaches them the names and best sayings of the great japanese scholars they have also plays which teach morals for instance one of their games is like our pussy wants a corner but in japan the pussy is known by a name which represents a japanese devil and the corners of the room are called the harbors of truth in which places only can safety be found the japanese are a moral people and the children go to church much as we do at home they often play about the churches or temples and picnic under their wide-spreading trees the japanese have two great religions the oldest is shinto which means the ways of the gods it consists largely of the worship of the heroes of japanese history the other is buddhism which was introduced into japan about six hundred a d it is one of the world's greatest religions and we shall see more of it in siam and burma connected with these religions are gods of many kinds every house has a little shrine in it before which the people place offerings and there are public shrines and temples devoted to religion in all parts of japan some of these are considered especially holy and pilgrims by the thousand with staves in their hands and with baggage tied to their backs walk from one to another to offer their prayers we meet buddhist priests who go about with shaved heads and we spend hours in admiring the temples which have been erected to buddha they are one-story structures of wood with heavy roofs of black tiles many are of vast extent and the interiors of some are gorgeous with carvings they have rooms papered with gold leaf and walled with paintings by the japanese masters they contain images plated with gold japan has one statue of buddha known as the dai butsu which is among the great artworks of the world this we visit at kamakura a small town on the sea coast not far from yokohama the statue is made of bronze plates so fitted together that the joints cannot be seen it is an immense sitting figure as tall as a four-story house it has eyes of pure gold and there is a great ball of silver in the middle of its forehead we get some idea of its size when we find that its bronze thumbs are so large that six of us can sit on each of them and have room to spare and that its golden eyes are each three feet in length end of chapter nine Chapter Ten of Carpenter's Geographical Reader, Asia, by Frank Carpenter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Betty B. Japanese Farms and Farmers. We shall now leave Tokyo for a trip through the country. We want to see how the people live outside the cities, and also to learn something of Japanese farming. How shall we travel? We might go by railroad and ride from one town to another 
almost as fast as on our own trains at home we should find the cars quite as good they are filled with japanese some of whom not used to foreign benches and chairs squat on the cushions with their feet tucked beneath them japan is fast building railroads trunk lines now connect all the main centers and the rates of fare are exceedingly low the railroad however is too quick for our journey so we shall take gin rickshaws with two men to each carriage and shall ride almost as fast as though we had horses one man will pull in the shafts and the other will push hard behind when we go up the hills or by a rope will harness himself to the front and run on ahead we soon get over our shame at driving our almond-eyed brothers and poke our human steeds in the back and urge them to hurry the roads are good there are villages at every few miles and we stay at night in country hotels where we sleep on the floor the landlord's children watch us with wonder as we come in when we have gone to our rooms they sometimes poke their fingers through the paper walls and gluing their eyes to the holes watch the strange foreigners as they undress and get into bed some of them have never seen an american and our straight eyes and fair faces seem to them very queer we have several rainy days on our journey during which we pass farmers and travellers wearing the waterproof cloak of japan this is a sort of long shawl of rice straw which with the big straw hat above it makes the wearer look like a gigantic yellow bird trotting along upon human legs we cross now and then over mountains so steep that we must leave our gin rickshaws and go up in kagos the kago is a framework hung to long poles which are carried on the shoulders of men we squat inside the kago cross-legged and hold on for dear life as our men take us over the stones through rushing mountain streams and along precipices going uphill and down we enjoy the beautiful scenery japan is made up of mountains and valleys and the moist air keeps nature refreshingly green the mountains feed many short rivers and brooks by the hundreds gurgle down the green hills these people understand irrigation some of the streams are dammed up in the mountains and the water is carried from one place to another through winding ditches so that one stream feeds many farms the hills are often cut into different levels or terraces over which the streams flow successively on their way to the valleys the mountainous nature of japan is such that less than one-sixth of the empire is under cultivation but that sixth gives more than half of the people constant employment producing enough to feed the entire population the soil is no richer than ours but the japanese so increase its fertility by good cultivation that one acre often yields from three to five times as much as the same space does in america it is said that there are farms in japan which for centuries have given two crops every year how queer the farms are the whole country looks like a garden with ponds of silvery white water showing out through the green there are no very large fields the average tract being less than two acres in size the crops are all of shades and colors from the gold of ripe wheat to the green of fresh sprouting rice we look in vain for fences houses and barns the japanese have no fences they do not live on their farms but in villages of thatched wooden houses strung along the main roads there is no need of barns as the crops are sold almost as soon as they are harvested there are but few sheep in japan and in some parts of the empire very few horses and cattle in many places the people would look upon sheep as wild animals cattle are still largely employed as pack animals and their meat is used more and more every year there are now over one million in the country breeds of fine horses have been brought in for the army and there are many pack horses in some parts of japan ponies are used for hauling and we often pass one hitched to a cart and led by a big hatted peasant the draft horses are shod with straw shoes the straw is so braided that it forms a round mat about half an inch thick which is fastened to the animal's foot by straw strings running around the leg just above the hoof each pack horse has a stock of fresh shoes 
tied to his saddle and the farmer who leads him changes his shoes as soon as they become worn such shoes cost less than one cent a set the distances through the country districts are often measured by the number of shoes which the horses wear out while travelling and it is said that the average horseshoe will last for a walk of over eight miles we observe that the farmers of japan have been less affected by our civilization than the people of the cities they live much as they did in the past and have many of the customs of old japan we occasionally see japanese women who seem very homely their heads are shaved close to the scalp and they have no sign of eyebrows upon inquiry we learn that they are widows who keep their heads shaved in order to show their grief for the loss of their husbands many of the peasant women look pretty until they open their mouths we then notice that their teeth are as black as a pair of new rubber shoes they are wives who are destroying their beauty to show their husbands that they do not care for the attentions of others the men in some cases have their heads shaved on the top with the long locks at the side and the back fastened up on the crown of the head in a stiff queue like a door knocker this is the old style of wearing the hair and was the usual fashion when perry came as time goes on these old-fashioned customs grow less and less common and they will doubtless in time disappear the farm hands of japan wear but little clothing when at work in the fields the weather is hot in the summer and some have on nothing except a flat hat of white straw as big as a parasol and a cloth tied around the waist we meet half-naked children with tools on their shoulders on their way to the fields we see barefooted women clad in big hats and blue cotton gowns the women and men labor away side by side and the children have their share in the toil how hard they all work they dig up the ground with mattock and spade and all sorts of seeds are planted by hand the harvesting is done the same way and we see that it is human muscle unaided by machinery which still makes the greater part of the bread of japan the crops are of all kinds the land is exceedingly fertile and nearly everything can be raised we see patches of wheat barley tobacco and cotton and of other plants which are strange to our eyes we go through thousands of rice fields rice is the most important crop of the country for it forms the chief food of the people the majority of the world's inhabitants eat more or less rice and for at least one-third of them it is the principal food there are almost as many different kinds of rice as of apples and japanese rice is one of the best it requires great care in its cultivation the grains must first be sowed in wet seed beds they sprout in four or five days and within a month or six weeks are ready for transplanting in the meantime the rice fields have been flooded and the farmers now wade through the water in their bare feet and set out the young sprouts in the mud they flood the fields again and again during the summer they keep the rice free from weeds and by the latter part of september the crop is ready for harvest rice grows much like wheat or oats at first the plants are a beautiful green but as they ripen they become a bright yellow the straw is then cut off close to the ground with a sickle and is tied up in little sheaves which are hung over a pole resting on legs so that the heads of the rice do not touch the ground the grains are pulled from the stems by drawing the straw through a rack which has teeth like a saw and are then laid away to be husked as required we find rice fields in all the lowlands there are many in hondo shikoku and kyushu and also in formosa the latter being farmed by the chinese who live there on some of the farms after the rice has been harvested barley and wheat are sown as a second crop and barley and rye are often ground up with rice and used for food beans are much raised and on the highlands buckwheat millet and sorghum the sorghum flour is made into dumplings and the buckwheat is used for the manufacture of macaroni we stop now and then at the tea fields which are to be found throughout the greater part of the empire and as we get nearer kyoto in central japan we spend a few days in the region of uja where the tea grows especially fine one kind is known by a japanese word meaning jewelled dew 
it is worth from five to eight dollars a pound it is in uja that much of the tea for the emperor is raised the tea plant is a kind of camellia it grows much like the american box in japan it is carefully cultivated in hedges which rise to a height of from three to five feet and which are usually about two feet in width in a tea garden the hedges run in parallel rows from one side to the other the rows being about as far apart as those of a potato field the leaves which form the tea of commerce look somewhat like those of a rose bush their color is a bright green the plants produce their best tea from the fifth to the tenth year and some are said to live longer than the life of a man they are plucked several times during each season the first crop being the best the work is done almost entirely by girls who pick out the bright new green leaves from the old dark ones they put the leaves in great baskets and carry them off on their backs the leaves are dried in the sun and are then steamed and dried again that part of the crop intended for export is shipped to the tea factories where all the moisture is taken out by rubbing the leaves about in great iron bowls set in ovens the rubbing is done by women and men under whose hands the leaves change their shape and become the little hard twisted things we buy as tea in america after the leaves are thoroughly dried they are sorted by japanese girls and are then packed in boxes for shipment another interesting occupation followed in many localities throughout japan is the rearing of silkworms the cocoons are spun by the worms which are fed upon mulberry leaves and both the cocoons and the raw silk reeled from them are exported in great quantities to europe and the united states the country has many mulberry orchards and its exports of raw silk and silk goods bring in several times as much money as any other article raised or made in japan on our trip across the country we learn that the government is doing much to encourage the farmers it has lecturers who go from district to district teaching them which crops will pay best and how to raise them there are many experiment stations and the people raise all sorts of grains just as we do there are schools where one can learn how to rear silkworms and the farmers have banks supported by the government at which they can borrow money at very low rates end of chapter ten chapter eleven of carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank carpenter this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by betty b commercial and industrial japan riding through tea gardens mulberry orchards and countless patches of cotton and rice we come at last to kyoto the old capital of japan it is a beautiful city not far from lake biwa and within an hour's ride of osaka the chicago of japan the region about kyoto and osaka is one of the busy parts of the world there are factories of all kinds scattered over the country including villages devoted to the making of porcelain cotton and silk goods kyoto is famous for its silks and its people have long woven the most beautiful fabrics on the rudest of looms they now have also the finest of modern silk mills run by electricity supplied by the falls of lake biwa osaka has many large cotton mills and there are others employing thousands of hands at the seaport of kobe which by train is only a half an hour away we visit the mills and find many children at work little ones not as old as ourselves are tending the looms laboring all day for less than one cent an hour they are bright-eyed and healthy they look up and smile at us as we pass in other places we go into the factories where straw braid is made the children sitting on the floor and plaiting the straw into the shapes for which it is used for bonnets and hats we go through mills where are made the japanese rugs of jute and cotton to be shipped to america and in kobe visit a great ironworks and shipyards where enormous steamers are built there are other fine shipbuilding yards at nagasaki and at wakamatsu is a government foundry making all sorts of iron and steel we are surprised at the skill of these people 
they do almost everything well and export goods of every description to all the world's markets the wages are much lower than ours the people live simply and it is said that they could easily thrive upon what we of the united states waste in the past everything was done by hand but now they are introducing our labor-saving inventions and are making more and more goods every year nevertheless much of the manufactures are still produced in small shops there are whole villages composed of little establishments devoted to the making of porcelain such as is shipped to america in these places the clay is modeled by hand and the men and women sit on the floor and paint the beautiful and curious designs found on japanese china in other establishments we see boys carving rats monkeys and other figures out of ivory tusks we visit shops where japanese lanterns are made and some in which men and boys are turning out umbrellas and fans there are also carpenter shops cooper shops and woodworkers of every description as we stay a while at each place we notice that the japanese laborer has what is equal to four hands and twenty fingers he is usually barefooted and he works so much with his feet that they serve as two extra hands he can hold all sorts of articles steady by pressing them between the soles of the feet as for instance the cobbler who thus makes wooden shoes his toes are equal to ten extra fingers and he can pick up a peg or pin with his toes we also observe that some japanese methods of work seem to be the direct opposites of ours there is a carpenter planing a board he pulls the plane toward him instead of pushing it from him as our carpenters do and when he uses the drawing knife he pushes instead of pulling as would seem to us to be the natural way the american begins his house with a foundation the japanese builder makes the roof first he puts it together in pieces upon a scaffolding of poles and then fills in the framework beneath the logs are often brought to the building and the boards sawed out by hand as they are needed in the older lumber yards of japan the sawmill is an almond-eyed bare-legged man who stands on top of a log or beneath it and pulls or pushes his saw until he has cut the log into boards we spend some time in osaka the commercial capital of the western part of the empire it is as large as philadelphia and has many manufacturing villages in its suburbs it has cotton and silk mills and factories for making matting and rugs it has many great wholesale establishments and also exporting houses which ship goods to all parts of the world during our stay here we learn much about japan's foreign trade we are told that the commerce of the empire now amounts to about five hundred million dollars a year and that it includes many articles which are shipped not only to china and other parts of asia but also to the various countries of europe and the united states as we go through the factories the men often tell us that they are working on goods intended for us and we learn that the united states is japan's best customer and that it sells us millions of dollars worth of goods every year is it not strange to think that many of the japanese children and grown-ups are all the time working to supply some of our wants and that at the same time we are making things which are sent back to them in exchange we buy of japan much more than she buys of us and her trade with us is increasing a great deal of the tea we drink comes from japanese bushes and much of the silk goods made in our mills is from cocoons reared in japan many of our houses are furnished with japanese rugs and our most beautiful mattings come from japan on the other hand we are shipping to japan many different kinds of machinery we are sending her leather iron goods and kerosene while much of the raw cotton used in her mills is raised in our southern states there is one export in which japan surpasses all other countries this is camphor a drug of which we buy many tons every year there are camphor groves scattered throughout the central islands and great forests of camphor trees in formosa in the village of tosa in western japan is a group of thirteen trees over one hundred years old which it is believed will produce about forty thousand pounds of crude camphor the camphor tree is an evergreen of the laurel family its trunk is somewhat like that of an oak 
it grows to be fifteen feet in diameter raising twenty or thirty feet from the ground before the branches begin some trees are several hundred years old in the production of camphor the trees are cut down and chopped up into chips and the chips are then boiled until the sap and oil in them rise up in a steam this is conducted through pipes kept cool by cold water running over them as the steam strikes the cold pipes it condenses and forms a deposit of oil and camphor from which the oil being pressed out comes the camphor of commerce from osaka a half hour by rail takes us to kobe the chief seaport of central japan it lies at the entrance of the famed inland sea through which we pass on our way to korea we travel in a japanese steamer floating among mountainous islands the hills of which are terraced so that they look like green steps rising from the water there are many black-roofed villages dotting the shores we pass through narrow channels moving in and out through japanese craft and at last find ourselves at anchor in the mountain-locked harbor of nagasaki the westernmost port of kyushu here we take coal hundreds of half-naked little japanese women passing it in small baskets from one to another from a barge on one side of the steamer until it is at last stored in the hold our ship is called the tokyo maru it is lighted by electricity and heated by steam and is almost as comfortable as that in which we cross the pacific the sailors and officers are japanese and we have many fellow japanese passengers on board we are almost as sorry as they at leaving japan and as our ship steams out into the ocean we look longingly back and with them cry out sayonara the japanese word meaning farewell end of chapter eleven